what do you guys see? Do you see I, some slides? Yeah, I think it's okay. perfect. All right. Hello, Riverside and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here. So I'm, as Daniela mentioned, I'm a professor in the Department of Biostats. And I hope this talk is going to be around like 20 to 25 minutes. And then we can have questions or we can open up the R markdown that I sent along with today's materials. So feel free to interrupt or I don't know, maybe Daniela, you can like moderate the chat. I, I probably won't focus on that so much, but I, I welcome questions if it's like appropriate. OK. Um, I realize I don't need to go over the slide because <laughs> I'll just state broadly my, my interests kind of sit at the, the nexus of stats, genomics, data science, and public health. And I also have a, a doppelganger. Her name's Puppet Stephanie. She's currently being used, well, not right now. She's stuck in my office. But prior to COVID, she was being used to um, create children's videos to teach young children about data science because if you have children, nobody wants to hear about data or like idea or no one wants to learn from an adult. It's a lot funnier to and more interesting to learn from a puppet. So we now have like a whole slew of puppets that are currently being used to teach data science, which is a ton of fun. I'll also just give a shout out to BioConnectors. I'm heavily involved with the BioConnector project, which is the motivation for the talk today. For example, I'm on the Bioconductor Technical Advisory Board. We have several advisory boards. We have a scientific advisory board, a community advisory board. So if you have any interest in getting involved with that, just reach out. And then I'm also an Our Ladies Baltimore um, co-founder and organizer. Okay, why can't I go? All right, so let's talk a little bit about biology. And I thought I would motivate the talk today with vaccines. So vaccines are on a lot of people's minds as, um, as people are struggling to, you know, cope with the pandemic. And um, I thought I would give a little bit of introduction about vaccines and then kind of dive into some biological data. So if you've ever, if you know anything about a vaccine, a vaccine is designed to produce an immune response in our body whenever we in, encounter a virus. So think about things like the coronavirus. Um, to date, there are over uh, 170, I think, uh, vaccines that are in like various stages of trials, uh, with the first trial kind of starting in 2020 for the coronavirus. Typically, it takes years. Like I think the fastest a vaccine has ever been created is four years. So it typically takes years to create a vaccine. Um, but some, I mean, I think it announced today Merck is going, is been given a, um, a contract from the U.S. government to produce 100 million vaccines by the end of the year. So, I mean, a lot of scientists are trying very hard to produce a vaccine for the coronavirus. So digging a little bit into the biology of it, um, how do you even create a vaccine? Well, there are these different stages. So there's preclinical trial, which gives vaccines to animals, mice or monkeys usually produce to see if it produces an immune response. And there's phase one, which is like our safety trials. They give a vaccine to just kind of like a small number of people, like eight, 10, just to make sure they're, it's safe and the dosage is right. Then there are phase two trials, kind of expansion. We give the vaccine to different populations of people. So um, children, elderly, and so forth to see if the vaccine affects different populations of the people differently. Then there's phase three, the efficacy trials. You give vaccines to thousands of people. So here you're interested in, in wanting, and you have to wait and see um, how many essentially become infected. And then there's the approval. So uh, to date, there are four phase three trials. So there's a lot of um, hope. <laughs> I think scientists are very positive about this. Um, but then there are a lot of different ways to create the vaccine. So because there are, as you can see, there are 170 vaccines and there are a variety of ways to create these vaccines. Um, genetic, so there's a genetic type of vaccine where you create a vaccine with one or more of the coronavirus's own genes to provoke an immune response. Then there are protein-based. So here you're using a coronavirus protein or a protein fragment. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that in a minute. Then you can use a viral vector. So you're using a virus to deliver the coronavirus genes into cells, or you can actually use the whole virus itself. So here you're using just kind of a weakened or inactivated version of the virus. And so as results of phase two um, start to emerge, we might see how different sub portions of the population might respond differently to these vaccines. And you might ask, well, why is that? Well, to answer that question, we need to talk a little bit about biology. So 
bear with me. I think this is going to be fun introduction to biology for anybody who doesn't know about this. Um, I'm going to switch topics from COVID vaccines to just kind of like this broader questions of what makes us diverse as individuals in a human population. Okay, so if you recall your high school biology class, this, or at least that's where I learned this, um, this story starts with what's known as the central dogma of biology. So here you have a piece of DNA. Oh, sorry. And this piece of DNA goes through what's called transcription. Transcription creates a gene. So what it essentially does is it takes different portions of the DNA and extracts them and then puts them together in this new product called a gene. And then that gene gets through, goes through another process called translation, and it creates what's called a protein. So I talked a little bit about gene protein fragment before when I was talking about um, the coronavirus vaccine. So it depends, like, which version of the molecule you interact with is, like, the, is how, is the, the type of molecule that the coronavirus vaccines are being built off of, whether it's a protein or whether it's the DNA itself, whether it's genetic and so forth. So genetics, if you've ever heard of the word genetics, it's interested in looking at changes in the DNA and associating it with some kind of phenotype. So they, they want to know if I, if I observe a change in the DNA, um, do I observe a change in the phenotype and what's the association between the two? I'm going to pick on my colleague, Jeff Leak. I feel like I can because I know him well enough to be able to do this. So it's okay if it gets back to him. Um, here are two pictures of species with different genomes and they have different phenotypes. So human and sloth. And if you know anything about Jeff, he's like the exact opposite of a sloth. So anyways, I thought that was funny. Okay, so we go back to the central dogma of um, biology. Genomics is, which is what I'm interested in, is interested in how all these things interact. So they're interested, or we're interested in essentially how changes in the RNA or changes in the DNA or how protein interacts with the DNA. So it turns out you could build this protein and then the protein actually goes back to the DNA and tells the DNA, okay, you need to make more protein. It's really cool. So there's all this interaction that goes along and of course, associating it with some kind of phenotype, um, like a case control setting or whatever it is. So Let's talk about data. How are these data generated? I've talked a little bit about what the data are. What are they, how do you get, what are the data that we work with as um, analysts who, who are in R or Python? Okay, so again, we're going back to this fragment of DNA, or this uh, section of DNA. What um, experimentalists do, I'm gonna like butcher this, but essentially what they do is fragment it up. They, they fragment the DNA into tiny little pieces, which means just to break it up. And then they produce what are called these reads or sequencing reads. They're little, tiny, short, 50, 100, 200 base pair reads. Sometimes they can actually be much longer. There are things called long reads. Um, but for this purpose, we'll just go with short reads. So there are these tiny little reads that, rep that come from these different fragments of DNA or RNA or whatever you're trying to capture. And the reads are the thing we get out of the biological experiment. At the end of the day, you get a big, big file specifically this is a screenshot with billions of reads, essentially. Um, and what do we do with these reads? Well, we have to figure out where these reads come from. So we have to figure out, I have a read, where does it map to somewhere in the human genome or a plant genome or a mouse genome and so forth. So let's think about going back to that uh, segment of DNA. If I have a gene, so this is the gene that um, codes for some kind of protein, for example. The, if I have a reference genome, what I do is I take all of these reads and my, my billions of reads from my, my file that comes out of the sequencing experiment, and I have to figure out where they come from. And essentially, it's a matching. It's um, a similarity match between the read and the genome, and the, the place that matches the highest is where it comes from. And so what you do is you figure out where all the reads come from, you sum them up, and then in this particular cartoon, I have 23 reads coming from gene XYZ. So I've got a count of 23 genes, uh, or 23 reads from gene XYZ in this one sample. And then what I do is I put it into a matrix. So I start to populate a matrix of these counts. So in gene one or in gene XYZ here, I've got 23 reads coming from sample one. 
Next, I start to do this for all of my samples. I count how many reads come from sample two, sample three. In this case, I've got six samples. So you can imagine like a case control setting with three samples who have a healthy state and three samples that have a disease state, for example. I do this again for a different gene and I count how many reads come from gene two. I repeat this for all of my genes. Turns out the humans, humans have around 20,000 protein coding genes. So quite a few genes. We have a lot of features. Genes are considered features. Samples are considered observations. And then this other data, uh, this other matrix that I'm going to show here, which I will talk about in a minute, it's, um, it's metadata. It's essentially very, very, very important bookkeeping. <laughs> so if you know anything about biology, we have these things called reference genomes, and those reference genomes constantly get updated. So somebody who says, ha, I have a reference genome. It's, this is what I want everybody to use to map the reads. A year later, that reference genome may change. And so you have to know exactly where the start site of the gene is and where the stop site of the gene is, what chromosome it came from, and what version of the genome was used to do the counting, essentially. So it's very, very important bookkeeping. Um, okay, but this matrix is the data that we typically analyze. And so, for example, we may be interested in saying, if I look at a gene and I say, I calculate the average of the reads from samples one, two, three, I can compare that to the, uh, the average reads uh, across all samples in four, five, six, for example. And I can say, what's the average, uh, what's the difference in average expression between um, samples one, two, three? and samples four, five, six. Is there a difference? Yes or no. And maybe that's informative for my outcome or my phenotype that I'm interested in. All right, so how do we analyze these genomic data? Well, I'm going to start out with CRAN. Um, so most people on this call, I'm hopeful, <laughs> uh, but maybe you're new and you're wanting to get more involved with R, totally fine too, um, use R. So I, that's why I started with this. And so here, there are on, on CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, there are over 10,000 packages that do a variety of things, import data, plotting um, to more specialized tasks, such as parsing data from the web, analyzing financial time series, analyzing clinical trials, all sorts of stuff. So if you're on Twitter or you're on your computer right now and you want to go over to um, a particular uh, website, you can either tweet about what's going on right now or you can go over to the R Project website. So this is a website where you can go learn about related projects to R. So um, there's a, a link to it here. And here you'll actually see that um, under, there's an area called specialized areas of application. The first one underneath that specialized area is something called bioconductor. And it lists some broad goals about bioconductor, um, but I'm gonna spend like the next 10 minutes talking about that now and kind of um, how you can use it and how you can, what you can do with it. So before we go though, let's talk about introductions. Uh, I always like to do introductions. So CRAN, meet your cousin Bioconductor, Bioconductor, meet your cousin CRAN. Okay, more seriously, um, you can think about Bioconductor as a cousin of CRAN, uh, but specific for the analysis of biological data. So as you can imagine, biological data comes with its own uh, horror stories and like drama that you have to know about to be able to maintain. Like you have to know about how to manage this metadata. It's not just the matrix of counts that we're interested in. We also have to know about information, where these counts come from. So Bioconductor is an open source and open development software project. I highlight that because open source means anybody can read or modify the underlying code, but open develop means Open development means anybody can contribute to the project. So we are a open source and open development project. It was began in 2001 by Robert Gentleman, um, who's actually, he was at 23andMe, but then it was just announced, I feel like a week or two ago, he's now at Harvard. So I have to update this now. Okay. <laughs> Um, but it, Bioconductor includes 12 full-time core developers. So these are funded based off of grants and they essentially help maintain the core infrastructure for Bioconductor. We'll talk about it in a minute, but Bioconductor has over 2000 packages and there's a lot of machinery that goes into making those packages work together. 
So some big priorities. Um, a lot of it is focused around reproducible research addressing domain specific challenges in, with high quality documentation. I think that's a really good way of summarizing it. So for example, every software package must come with a vignette. It must come with something demonstrating the use of the, how the functions will be used. It's not sufficient to just have a documentation manual. There is a lot of community support. So you can either get this through a support site in which you can go ask questions and read through the years of um, questions that have been asked. You can also, we have a Slack workspace. So you can join um, Bioconductor, BioC community, dash community, I think is what it is. I should know this. It's open to anybody. We're having our um, virtual conference next week. I think it's sold out, unfortunately, but I think everything will be recorded. Um, there are a lot of workflows that exist to help users get started with answering or analyzing biological data. So one of the most common questions I get are, I've got this new RNA sequencing data set and I don't know what to do with it. And there are a lot of workflows that basically take you from raw reads to interpretable, understandable um, results from an analyses trying to get you to where you need to go. A lot of great teaching resources. And then Bioconductor strongly encourages the use of existing data and infrastructure, software infrastructure um, to enable interoperability between packages. So the, I just wanna, before I leave the, the overall picture, I think the mental image that Bioconductor aims for is that there are a lot of tools and packages for the analysis of genomic data, similar to the way there are many individuals, mus individual musicians in an orchestra who are all kind of like doing their own thing. But to make them work together, Bioconductor functions really as a conductor to, to the orchestra to provide this flexible platform that integrates everything together. So this is kind of like the image I like to leave with people to help kind of explain it. So let's talk a little bit about um, what's in Bioconductor, for example. So to do that, I thought I would showcase the BioC package tools uh, package. And here I'm showing you in one line of code how you can get to a tibble or a tidy data frame for all the download statistics for all bioconductor packages. So here on the first line we have library BioC package tools, just loading the library. And then in one line of code you get uh, PKGS packages, which for each row contains information about for a given package in a given year, in a given month, the number of distinct IP downloads and the number of downloads. And then you also get this thing called repo. It's um, essentially a delineator or categorization of the type of package. So you could ask, well, what are the different types of packages and how many are available of each type? So because it's a, a tidy data frame, um, a tibble, then basically the world of the tidyverse is open to you to be able to wrangle this, this data frame however you wish. You can, for example, I saw somebody post on BioC Slack earlier. Um, there are apparently no packages out of 2000 packages. There are no packages that start with the letter J. Two of them start with the letter G. So you could, for example, use you know, start from the tidyverse to extract the first letter of all the packages and then tabulate essentially the number of packages that come from each letter. So maybe this is going to be helpful when you want to figure out how to name your package. Um, but the point is the tidyverse is available because like it's a tidy, it's a tipple. So here we see that there are around 2000 software packages. There are things called annotation data and experiment data. So annotation um, streamlines that tedious bookkeeping that I talked about for that metadata. That's, that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about that, but it just makes that process a lot easier. Experiment data, um, these contain process or not um, data sets and they are really useful for teaching or really useful for demonstration of um, packages. So if you want to demonstrate your, your function with some existing data, they're really, are a lot of great resources um, in the experiment data packages that you can use to just quickly load in and then demonstrate your functions on. So Bioconductor has had a pretty steady increase of software packages over time, um, again, with around 2000 to date. So it's, it's, that's really great to see. And then in the last few minutes, I thought I would talk about uh, this kind of the standard Bioconductor data structure. So this is what's called the genomic ranges object. And as you can imagine, you need to have a 
couple of information, you need to have some information. You need to know, for example, in a given genomic region, um, you need to know what chromosome is this um, region coming from. So like chromosome one, chromosome two, and so forth. What position does this region start? What position does this region end? I'm going to skip over strand. Strand is not relevant for this talk. So there's, again, tedious bookkeeping, basically. And then gene ID. So genes, apparently, they have different types of names. And different um, databases name genes differently. So you can have um, gene IDs for, for one database, and they can map to a different database. And then score. So you can think about score as some like generic um, thing that you're interested in, in keeping track of for this genomic region. It might be counts, like the number of reads that map to that genomic region and so forth. How do you actually create this object? So it's very easy. In R, we have a granges function, which allows you to essentially create a granges object in a, in a very straightforward manner. So here I'm creating a granges object with two regions, both from chromosome one, uh, one has a score of 10, one has a score of 25. So things you can do with a granges object, you can calculate the width. So you might want to know what's the width of my, my region. You can also, um, because it's an object that's in R, you can apply base R syntax to be able to, to work with this object in a way that would allow you, that you would be familiar working with them in like a, a, a data frame. But I just want to highlight that because the tidyverse has become so influential in the world of R, there has been a lot of great work, um, for example, or contributed to, to make the analysis of genomic data more human readable, similar to the way that the tidyverse was designed to make the analysis of data, uh, the code that we write more human readable. So this is not my work. This is work by Stuart, the brainchilds of Stuart Lee, Di Cook, and Michael Lawrence. It's the Ply Ranges package. And essentially, they're genomic verbs and actions uh, yeah, that, for tidy data. So the idea is to basically define an API, meaning basically extend the dplyr API, uh, which is already like really great idea, that maps relational genomic algebra to verbs that can act in a, a tidy, an act on a tidy genomic data. And I'll explain more what I mean by that. Another great idea to basically borrow dplyr's syntax, why invent new syntax when dplyr is really good. So things like filter and select are, exist in this, um, this framework. And another great idea, compose verbs together with the pipe operator from a gritter, for example. So just to give a, a little showcase, you can load the ply ranges object and that g ranges object that I showed you before. You can pipe that object into a function called filter. And I'm asking for it to filter everything with a score of greater than 15. So everything on the left side of the granges object is required to be there. And on the right side, you can have whatever you want. So you can have diff all different types of metadata. So you're asking it to filter based on some score. And then you can just calculate the width. Um, so it's meant to, this package, for example, is meant to make genomic data analysis more human readable. I'm going to skip over this. There's a lot of um, functions that you may recognize. Essentially, the ones in bold, those are the ones that are actually in dplyr. But then there's a lot of other um, things that with genomic data that are more, more nuanced. So those are, those are new, uh, essentially, action verbs. And you can also leverage ggplot. So because things are designed in a way to work with the tidyverse, um, essentially, like you can quickly plot um, the scores for all the genomic regions and see how things look. And so I'm going to maybe, I, I have this here just in case people want to go to the R markdown that I, I wrote. It's basically all the code that's in here in my slide deck that you can um, just load and run yourself. But I'll just skip it for now and maybe get to it in, in one minute. I will give a shout out if you are interested at all in single cell RNA sequencing. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore what I'm saying. But if it perks up your ears, I, I helped write a book down, um, a book uh, called Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis with Bioconductor to help new people and developers um, know how to analyze single cell RNA seq data. So when I when I started this project a couple of years ago, there were a lot of um, vignettes in Bioconductor for over a hundred single cell packages, but there wasn't really a, a place for it to, to be integrated together. 
So this is designed to essentially integrate and demonstrate how to go from raw counts or raw reads all the way to getting clusters of single cell with, with interpretation. Um, and it kind of integrates everything together. So I give a shout out to that in case you're interested. And I will end it there. I'll gladly take questions. Should I stop sharing my screen? screen? Sorry. It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. I would so rather we can open, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can open up for, up for questions. Um, let me send again the link to, um, to get your presentation slides and the markdown if anyone is interested. Definitely. So, so if nobody asks me a question, I'm going to start asking you guys questions. Does anybody <laughs> do genomic data analysis who's on the call? Are interested in getting involved with genomic data analysis? Oh, I see a yes. Is that a yes? Okay, Marie <laughs> says yes. <laughs> Any yes? Oh, three yeses. Okay. So, what kind of data do you have, or what kind of questions do you have? I, I think we do have a question here. How efficient oh. would bioconductor be for aligning the whole genome data, since that is a, a RAM intensive process? Right, that's a great question. So there are a lot of great alignment tools out there already, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel there. Similar to um, like imaging, for example. So Bioconductor doesn't have a strong presence in the analysis of imaging data, but I think we're recognizing that that's important. And so the approach that we've taken for quantification or the alignment is to basically have wrappers around existing packages. So whether you're using Callisto or whether you're using Salmon and Alvin framework or whether you're using um, whatever you're using, essentially that happens outside of R or there are packages inside of Bioconductor that essentially are wrappers around that existing software, assuming that that software is already installed in your system. My package does that too. So a little <laughs> bit of advertise here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are the advantages of single cell? Oh, great question. So this is getting a little weeds, but I think there are, the thing I, I wanna just push back on just for one minute is that single cell is great for a variety of questions. Single cell does not need everybody does not need to go out and do single cell RNA sequencing. So there are certain, um, certain biological questions that can really only be answered at the single cell level. And then there are certain biological questions that you really don't need single cell for at all. I think some advantages that it offers is if your question is basically designed to, um, for only single cell data, like if you're interested in embryonic development, if you're interested in tumor heterogeneity, if you're interested, I mean, there are like cell types. There are a couple of applications, a lot of applications in which single cell RNA-seq is does, like ideal for. Um, and I think one thing I should just mention is that a lot of the technical problems that we saw in bulk RNA-seq, we still see in single cell, except it's worse because in bulk RNA-seq, we saw an average of expression for every sample. It was an average of expression across millions of cells. And then in single cell, you have very, 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 very noisy data. And so we, we had all the same problems that we had before, but just amplified even worse. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages. However, there's been a lot of great development. For example, the R bioconductor packages that have been developed to be able to alleviate and remove that noise to be able to get biological signal. So pros and cons. What's next? We do have two questions. Uh, oh, wait, so I am, okay, no. How does the tissue sample get reads to produce the numbers? I'm gonna interpret this, Madeline, and you should feel free to write me if I didn't interpret this correctly. Um, how do you go from the tissue sample to the reads? to produce the numbers. Essentially what we do is, um, if that's your, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. So if, if that's, okay. So what we do is we take the tissue sample. If we're gonna take, um, let's, let's go with single cell because I've been talking about single cell. So we take the tissue sample 
you do, you, you go through a process called disassociation. So you basically take the tissue, which is if I take a piece of my skin, I've got, you know, millions of cells here. You have to shake apart the cells. So we have to get them separated and basically individualized into different aliquots. And there are different technologies that have been designed to do this in a variety of different ways. But essentially you need to get a cell isolated. Then what we do is um, depending on the technology you use, you could, for example, if I've got my cell in a little aliquot and a little droplet, for example, you could take the cell and the cell is lysed. So the cell basically releases all the RNA in it and it all gets tagged with little barcodes. These barcodes are called UMIs. I don't know if that's too much information, unique molecular identifiers. They're unique for every RNA and every cell. Um, and so what happens is when it goes through this process of the fragmentation and um, creating these reads, you get little, um, you have information about exactly which RNA came from, the read came from. And so at the end of the day, you essentially get a count of reads and that is what's in the matrix. Did that answer your question? I'll give you a minute to reply. <laughs> Uh, okay, where are we at next? Yes, thanks. Oh, yeah. perfect. Okay. I am trying to figure out some positioning in various pathophysio condition, mainly using nanoport. Can you tell me how I use biochar to minimize the error? This is outside of my wheelhouse. So I have just started working with some researchers on nanopore, but I am not at all well versed enough. What I would encourage you to do is to join Bioconductor community Slack space and ask there or the support site because I am, it's just, it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> Biology is very big. <laughs> so, okay, what is next? What R packages do you recommend to analyze single cell RNA-seq data? Well, if you're here, I'm gonna guess you wanna use R. Now, there are some great packages in Python too. I'll just give a shout out to um, the ScanP group, they are ScanPi. I never know if it's ScanP or ScanPi. Uh, Fabian Thais out of, he has produced this um, package in Python and it's really, really great. I use R a lot, so I tend to advocate R packages. Within R, there are, I would say like two big players for single cell. There's one called Surat and that comes from Rahul Sujita's group out of the New York Genome Center. That's kind of like, um, one pack, one mega package. He has an enormous amount of people working in his group and it all kind of gets populated into this one package called Surat. And then there's the Bioconductor framework, which is more open development. So anybody can um, contribute to it, but then it requires like some coordination. And so I think the benefits between like Surat and Bioconductor is like Surat kind of makes all the decisions for you. It like mints, it's designed to take you from like raw counts to analysis without you having to decide much. Well, Bioconductor gives you a lot more flexibility on which packages you want to use, which clustering methods you want to use, which normalization methods you want to use. Um, and I like this approach because as a data scientist, I know often my methods are like the assumptions of methods are violated by certain data sets, like data are never normal, for example. And if your method assumes normality, that's a big problem. And so I tend to like having things more modular where I can like switch things in and out and allow flexibility for what I think is best. So around it's harder to do that. It's like, you just kind of have to trust that things are going to work out. But they, I mean, it works out most of the time, but if you want like more flexibility, Bioconnector is really great. Also, you just have like a lot more um, options for the types of things that you can use. So if we're talking about Bioconnector now. Within the Bioconnector framework, I highly suggest checking out the Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis book. That's, that's where we put a lot of, to answer your question specifically about what packages, that's where we make those recommendations. But we also demonstrate to you with data sets how to use them. So it's very easy for you to copy and paste code so you can analyze your own data. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, that was probably too long. Um, interested in genomic data science, but no background in biology. Oh, welcome to my world. That's where I was too. I had <laughs> figured this out on my own. Yeah. Happy eyes. How do I start? Tools and languages. Interesting. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you learn. Like you could try a massive open online course, a MOOC. You could, I mean, I'm personally the kind of person that 
likes to dive in with data. So I like to be handed a data set and a question or come up with my own question as like data scientists do and basically start analyze with my hands on the data, trying to figure out like following along with somebody's workflow or analysis and then um, being able to do it with my own hands in my own R console, for example. And when I come across a term that I don't know or it's something I don't understand, then I go look it up. Alternatively, you could probably, you know, take a course and learn about all these terms and then start analyzing data. I guess it depends on kind of your learning style. So I don't know. Where are we? Uh, Biofactory. Okay, so you, okay, thanks. Oscar, what exactly are the advantages of bioconductor versus CRAN? So I think if, I mean, then feel free to correct me if you have thoughts on this, you know, but uh, I think if you're analyzing biological data and you want it to be used by that community, like people who would be also analyzing biological data, it's a, it's a very nice place to put it in bioconductor. If you're analyzing like just broad data types, I think CRAN makes more sense. Now, I was recently involved in a package called GLM-PCA, and it was developed an application for single cell RNA sequencing. And so we had a debate about whether we should put this in CRAN or bioconductor. And what we settled on was GLM-PCA, the concept of generalized principal components is broadly applicable to other data types. It's not designed, I mean, it was, a rich, it was developed in, in um, an application for single cell, but it can be like broadly applied. So what we did was we created a CRAN package, which essentially has like the optimization algorithm and like the hard, hardcore code itself, like the heavy lifting in the CRAN package. And then we created a bioconductor package that basically loads in the CRAN package. And then it has all the, the nice bioconductor things that you would want. Like it works with S4 objects and the single cell experiment, but like the CRAN package is accessible to anybody who would want to just use like generalized principal components. So I don't know. I mean, I've done hybrids. Like that's a, I would call like a hybrid solution, but it's up to you as a researcher of like where you think it is best. Hopefully that answered your question, Julia. Okay. What is next? I think we had one up there. It was like, what are package you recommend to analyze single um, RNA um, second data? But I think you already answered that. Okay. Yeah. What are the best yes. resources to move from our user to our package developer? Hmm. Again, I think it depends on your style. So you could, for example, go read Hadley has a great book on um, our package development. You could, Hadley Wickham, I'm sorry. You could do that or you could, you know, hands on the ground, like boots on the ground, attempt to um, do this where you kind of like do a little bit of reading and then like you do this with your hands on the computer and you try to implement this. I just tend to work better when I've got like a data set or I've got functions in mind. I mean, people say in general, when you're, um, you're writing the same function or you're like reusing the same function four or five times, make a package. I mean, I don't know, it's up to you kind of as a, as a developer. I'd love other people's feedback on when you should make a package. But um, there are a lot of great ways to basically learn how to make packages. I teach this in my courses and I mean, I'm sure that there are, um, uh, MOOCs online in which you can follow. There are a lot of great resources I've seen from other, um, especially people in our, like employees of our studio who produce contents about creating our packages. Also, Bioconductor has these um, pages from developers. So then oh, you yeah, can find right, a yeah. lot of information, yeah. like code style, style, how you build a package and um, a lot of good things there. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. I, I, did, I am adding the links. She's, she's talking and I'm adding the links. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm new to genomic data. Welcome. I have experience with polygenetic genetic risk scores. What exactly is the data that is being uploaded to Bioconductor and the structure of it? Are you talking about for genetic data where you use like these risk scores? Or are you talking about just like that's a very, they're different data types. So there are um, data, they're data sets that are working at the gene level, they're data sets that are working at the protein level, they're data sets that work 
with, some, I didn't even talk about this, methylation. Um, there are data sets that work with something called a tax seek. I mean, it depends on what the data are. Generally, they're working in some kind of S4 object. So BioConnector is very a big um, advocate of S4 objects. And so if you've ever worked with S4 objects, they can be a pain to use, but they can also be magical once you've set them up. <laughs> like, it can be very painful to learn them for the first time, at least it was for me. But then like once you kind of understand the ideas behind them, it makes it super easy for a user to interact with them the way you would want them to interact with them. So it's never like just a CSV file. Um, it's more complicated than that, but uh, I think it's intentionally designed such that it minimizes the errors that a user could make. So did that answer your question, Claire? That helps, okay, sounds good. I think we have a few more minutes if you have any more questions. I'd love to hear more about what you guys are doing as well, if you want to chime in on the chat or your mic. I think my journey, my journey for, um, Create a package was amazing. I, I I learned so much in the process to create a package. Well, how did you learn it? That going right. was it like reading a book or did you just do it kind of like hands on? Doing, yeah, doing hands on, it? totally. Yes, of course. I, on the same time, I was like looking the books and um, like looking the material and everything, but it was basically doing the um, everything. That's generally how I work best. So, but yeah. I understand their different learning styles. Some people just like want to hit like a physical book that they just want to like read front to end. And then they'll be like, okay, now I want to try this. And I, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> they are seeing what kind of analysis. Transcriptomics, RNA seq, V for R or Python. Cool. Nice. Are you using bioconductor packages? Or are you interested in like learning more about it? Yeah, so the, the MOOC from Harvard edX um, for R for Genomics is, was designed by uh, Raphael Irizarry. So he was my postdoc mentor and Mike Love. So Mike Love was a postdoc with me at the time and now um, he's a professor at UNC Biostat, University of North Carolina Biostats. Highly recommend it. I created um, the DPLY-R video myself as part of that book so I was a little bit involved but it was my first kind of intro to to MOOCs which um, have their pros and cons so as part of the data science lab we're also interested in uh, we create MOOCs like we have a, a data science MOOC on Coursera that's pretty popular but we're really interested in like automating that process so we've developed tech, a software um, that essentially allows you to take an R markdown which has got text in it and a set of Google Slides. And what happens is we take the R markdown and we run it through um, like um, Google Voice or Amazon, Elect or Amazon and we get it into a voice. Uh, we convert it into like whatever kind of voice you want. And then we knit, it's just imagine knitting the voice with the slides together. And it knows when you switch slides because the R markdown has these tags. And so what we've done is we've not, we're now creating MOOCs in an automated way where like, say there's like a bug, you know, in the video at two minutes, like somebody miss, like it was miswritten. Then all you do is you essentially like edit the R markdown, you re-knit the voice and then recreate the voice and then knit the slides with the voice and then you're, you're like back up and running. So it, it minimizes the time that you would have to like go into a studio, record, and you've got like a haircut and it's really awkward and um, you have to, anyway. So we're trying to do this in like an automated way, which is a lot of fun. Nice, I didn't know about that. A lot of cool things. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about that too. Sorry. Um, okay. What are we talking about? Population to know. So coral reef fishes. Oh, wow. I'd love to talk more about that. That's cool. Can you briefly talk about G ranges to calculate 
averages over sliding windows and or point to source. Yeah, so there are actually quite a few resources for G ranges objects and I, I'm happy to send them afterwards. I, um, I'd rather just keep chatting for now, but there are some great resources for doing that. Is there an accessible example? Is that related to sliding windows? Oh yeah, so yes, yeah, so it's um, the technology is called Ari, and I can send this to you. The person who developed the technology is called John Michelli. He's a faculty member in our department. But Jeff Leak is also involved with that, and I'm helping create MOOCs with it. It's essentially like a big R package, though, <laughs> which is cool. You could do so much with R. <laughs> Honestly, like the real reason why I love R so much is because I love seeing for the first time when somebody realizes and is like becomes empowered to be able to know that they can take something so raw like as data that is hard to to extract information from and like what the first time that they realize like how powerful it is to be able to use R to to you know make decisions informed decisions like it's such an empowering thing and I I just love being able to help new users and like new students kind of discover that. Um, I mean, that's kind of what I went through whenever I, I started in R and it's just, it's, it's addictive. <laughs> I believe the IC package, they also have this void recognition. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's, I think probably it's different, but I, I saw some, they have something like that. Yeah, so this happened, I think, almost a year ago was the first time that they had. So IC is, um, uh, yeah. is a summarized experiment um, object. No, okay. Interactive, Interactive shiny? shiny. Yeah. I, yeah, that's what it is. Sorry. And it's allowing you to basically explore summarized experiments, which are a particular type of object and bioconductor in an interactive way. So you can make like a lot of cool plots and, and do a lot of great things. But the, one of the, the authors of the package, he, as like a proof of principle, he wanted to like, you know, see if this could work. And so he uploaded a video to the IC channel almost a year ago in which he was sitting there making crepes. So he was like sitting there like count, like busting, like busting his eggs on the bowl and like putting them in there. And he was like, I see, add the left plot or add this to the left plot. And then it like changed. And I was just like, oh my God, this is opening up a new world <laughs> for our packages, which I totally support. And I thought was really cool. <laughs> but yeah, voice recognition. Can I, can I ask something? Just yes. The chat? So I was just briefly out of the room when so this question about G ranges and sliding windows, you mentioned that there was maybe a package. What is the package called? Um, I would have to look that up. It's been a little while. I mean, I'm not well versed in that. I mean, I've heard of this before. Like it's come across and it's probably somewhere in my Evernote. I'm going to have to look that up though. Okay. We can send uh, later on all these links and all these resources. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. So yeah, if you ever want to try running any of the code, there's an R markdown that is all the code that was used in my slides. Uh, it's, it's in the R markdown, so you can follow along. Okay, someone has more questions? Well, okay. thank you for the opportunity yeah. to present. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. Combination yeah. of our ladies and genomics. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for agreeing to, to, to talk with us. Uh, I personally learned so much. So it was, was amazing. Thank you very much. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and I really appreciate it. All right. Take yeah. care. Bye. Bye, guys. See you soon.